are living veterans. And so uh, if you haven't turned your pictures and mementos into Kathy yet, bring them with you Saturday or Sunday morning, and uh, we'll find a place for them out there on the table. Uh, be in prayer for our singing coming up the 16th. That'll be Thursday week, week from tomorrow, 7 o'clock. Hear the inspirations. Family Day the 19th. And then midweek service moved to Tuesday on the week of Thanksgiving the 21st. Also coming up on uh, November the 18th, uh, here at the church at 4 p.m. down in the fellowship building. That'll be Saturday week. Uh, Brother Bill Shepherd is celebrating his 90th birthday and uh, so if you have an RSVP to his daughter or granddaughter yet please do so by Saturday and uh, their names and numbers are out there on the board on uh, the announcement please no gifts so keep that in mind we're looking forward to that all right uh, Philippians chapter 1 and we're going to read just these last few verses here in Philippians chapter 1 and then we're going to bring a message and the Bible says in Philippians 1, 27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Encouragement, assurance, and Joy in difficult times, our study of Paul's epistle to the Philippians. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask your blessing upon the reading of your word tonight. And Father, we pray that we'll glean the great truths that Paul uh, shared with the believing people uh, at the church of Philippi. Lord, may we hear the same message they heard. And Lord, may we embrace it as they did. For we, like they, are living in last times. And Lord, we've got a big job to do as the children of God. Help us, encourage us, dear Lord, to get the work done while we can, while it's light, while we have opportunity. And Lord, let us not waste these days for some token fleshly pleasure May our hearts and our minds be focused on these last days and defending our faith. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I titled the message tonight, Preparing for the Battles. Preparing for the Battles. In these closing verses of uh, Philippians chapter number 1, Paul imparts a cold hard fact to those believers at Philippi and it was namely this that the Christian life isn't a playground it's a battlefield and we need to be reminded of that and 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 as we as we conclude this first chapter we take a look back for just a moment and and recall that Paul here has uh, told these Philippian believers in the first 11 verses of the chapter uh, that they are sons in the family of God. And in the verses we studied last week, in verses 12 to 26, he shared with them that they were servants, sharing in the furtherance of the gospel. And tonight, as we he heard him in these closing verses of this first chapter, uh, he's going to tell them tonight that they're soldiers. Soldiers defending the faith of the gospel. Of course, the faith of the gospel is that body of divine truth that's been given to the church. Now, our brother Jude, in his epistle just before the revelation, uh, he spoke about 
the same subject that Paul is talking about in these latter verses. He talked about defending the faith, standing for the faith. And, and, and Jude put it like this in verse 3 of that epistle. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Uh, that's the same thought process that Paul is having here at the end of Philippians chapter 1. Jude said to earnestly contend for the faith. That word earnestly means uh, zealously and eagerly and with a fixed attention. It means to be serious. It means uh, to be, have a fervor and a fervency about you and to have your eyes firmly fixed upon the prize of defending and contending for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And when he says to contend, he says earnestly contend, that word contend means to strive. It, it, it carries with it the meaning of a, a relay race. Now back in, uh, back in the days of Paul, uh, when the Greeks uh, uh, would put on those games, uh, you've all seen the relay race. A lot of times there'll, there may be two runners, maybe three runners, maybe as many as four runners. And they all have a baton. And uh, one of the secrets to winning that race is being able to know how to stretch your body as far as you can, like a first baseman on a baseball diamond trying to scoop up a throw to get a runner out. Uh, the idea here of, uh, of contending is like the runner who's stretching as far as he can uh, to give that baton to the next runner in the next leg of the race. He's telling us to be that serious and to be that sold out, to strive in defense and debate and in dispute. Now Paul tells Timothy the reason why we need to prepare for the battles that are coming and the battles that are yet here. And it's just going to get worse. I don't mean to be a fatalist when I say that, but I speak the truth. Things are not going to get better before Jesus comes. They're only going to wax worse and worse. And we need to be prepared as the children of God to be found standing and be found defending and contending for the faith that was once delivered uh, to the saints. So Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.1, he says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now Paul here reminds Timothy uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11 uh, that the glorious gospel of the blessed God has been committed to his trust. Uh, he tells Timothy that. He says uh, that God has committed unto my trust the glorious gospel of the blessed God. And then Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter number 6 and verse number 20 uh, that he would be committed uh, with the trust of the glorious gospel of Christ and that he was to commit it to faithful men uh, that may be able to teach others also in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And, and this is why the church... Uh, today needs to be busy about the business of not only winning souls to Christ and not only, not only baptizing them in the waters of belie believers' baptism, but be busy about discipling young Christians, teaching them, training them to know and to appreciate and to engage in the defense and preservation of this wonderful faith that has been delivered to you and me uh, as born-again children of God. Paul gives us a good reason in our text tonight. In verse number 28, he emphasizes why we need to be preparing for the battles. He says, because of 
their adversaries. He says in verse 28, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. Our adversaries, I want you to understand them. I want you to understand their, their purpose and what they're doing. Our adversaries are out to steal the treasure of our faith that's been committed to us. That's what they want to destroy. Jude, back in his epistle, reminded us in the fourth verse, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. That word lasciviousness means filthiness or nastiness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're engaged in that same fight today. The world is trying to destroy our old time religion and our faith by attempting to squash our faith and our fervor for serving the Lord by creating laws and regulations that would remove our religious freedoms. We must fight against this. One place that we can fight about, fight against it, you had the opportunity to do yesterday. Vote. Vote. We can make changes, but we'll have to make it at the ballot box. We can't go out as vigilantes and take the law into our own hands. That won't get anything done. It's a shame how few people voted yesterday. You say, well, I live in an area I didn't have anything to vote for. I'm not talking to you then. But if you had the opportunity to go vote yesterday and you didn't go vote yesterday, shame on you. If you were able and just chose not to, didn't think it was important. But you see, we as the born-again children of God, defending our faith, is more than just making our voice heard at the ballot box. We need to make our voice heard and stand up and take a stand on some things and stand up and make some sacrifices for what's right and for what's holy and for what's godly in our generation. You know why we ought to do that? Because our children and our children's children ought to know where we stand for God. They ought to know that we stand for His Word and that we will not give up or give in or give over to God's enemies. See, ungodly religious systems are trying to destroy our old-time religion and our faith by attempting to squash our faith and fervor by personal attacks and violence. In the latest action, Fox News reported yesterday that on Sunday... 69-year-old Paul Kessler, a Jewish man, lost his life at the hands of a pro-Palestinian protester at a Rally for Israel event in Ventura County, California, at a pro-Israel rally. The death has been officially ruled a homicide, yet police have failed to make an arrest. You see, my friends, we're living in a land of violence. And Satan is behind all of it. With his ultimate goal is still trying to destroy the promised seed, the Lord Jesus Christ. And may I say, while I'm on this little roll here, that Christianity today is not for sissies. It's going to take a backbone. We're in a heated war against the devil and his forces of evil both in the world and in ungodly religious systems. But we should count it an honor to serve in His army and to fight these fights that we need to fight. Well, if you want us to fight, preacher, what are we supposed to fight with? What have we got to fight with? Well, Paul told us in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Let me tell you what your weapons are. Number one, the Word of God. That's your greatest weapon. Hebrews 4.12 reminds us, for the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing 
even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God has given you the Word of God to be an offensive weapon. He's also given you the armor of God to defend yourself with. Ephesians 6, 11, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. God's given you his word as a weapon to stand in these fights. He's given you the armor of God to protect yourself against the wiles and the fiery darts of the devil. But Ephesians six eighteen also tells us of our mightiest resource and our mightiest weapon, and that's prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Are you listening tonight? Prayer changes things. Prayer gets heaven's attention. Prayer invokes a movement of God in our life and in our situation. Do you think that it was just a happenstance that, um, that our legislators in Raleigh overrode that governor's wicked abortion law and, and put in place a, a plan that would save thousands of babies? No, my friend, that was the act of God as a result of praying people and bombarding the throne of grace and pleading with God to intervene and intercede. And he did that very thing. We're in a battle. We're in a fight. We're in a war. Now let's look at our text here for just a moment. And it'll be a brief moment. But I want you to see here in these verses tonight that Paul gives the believers in, in Philippi three essentials for victory in the battle. I want you to notice them with me. As we're protecting this faith, he says here are three essentials for victory. Number one, consistency. Write that down. We're talking about a consistent life. This is talking about being unyielding in battle. You see, our battles won't be won by sermons or by speeches but by a solid, Christian, consistent Christian life. He says in verse 27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That word conversation there means our manner of life. In churches today, there's too much up and down, too much in and out, and too much up and down and too much in and out gives the devil a foothold to break in and to steal, to steal your convictions and to steal your fervency and to steal your joy and to steal your peace and to steal your testimony. And if he's left unchecked and if he's left unbattled, he'll steal your family and he'll steal your rewards that are waiting on you in heaven. John the Apostle, wrote in his second epistle, 2 John, in uh, verses 7 and 8, he says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. This is our enemy. This is who's trying to steal the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And so John said, look to yourselves that you lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. And Paul reminded the church of the Colossians that they should walk worthy, walk worthy of what Jesus did for them. He said in Colossians 1.9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, 
do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God living a consistent life not just when times are good but when the times are not good living for God living for the Lord a consistent life will bring victory the second one is in the latter part of verse 27 when he says uh, that whether I come and see you or else be absent I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel second element a victory in, de in defending the faith is not only consistency but cooperation and when I'm talking about cooperation I'm talking about being undivided in battle consistency is unyielding in battle cooperation is being undivided in battle divide and conquer that's the that's Satan's MO he tries to sow seeds of discord among the people of God with the hope of starting some infighting amongst the brethren and the believers to call gaps, cause caps, gaps and divisions, and making the church of the living God ineffective in the world today. Sowing discord, my friend. Hear me now. Listen to the old preacher. Sowing discord is one of seven sins that the Bible says are an abomination unto God. An abomination unto God. An abomination. It, 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 it brings up a level of disgust and hate in God's face that cannot be any higher. He cannot hate a sin any worse than the sin he calls an abomination. In Proverbs chapter 6, beginning in verse 16, the Bible says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. My friend, we may commit a lot of sins in our life, and most of them we don't mean to, we don't intend to, we don't do it maliciously. My friend, you start trying to sow discord among God's people, you're walking on thin ice with God. And uh, I, just, I, I would just advise you, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't be sowing the discord. The devil's doing a, enough trying to do that himself. You see, victory in the battles for the local church will come when the church stands together in one accord. Notice in verse 30, 27, he uses three phrases to drive that point home. He tells them in verse 27 to stand fast in one spirit. He tells them to have one mind. And he tells them to strive together. You know the psalmist David wrote in Psalms 133 and verse number 1, Behold how good and pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. Now the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, and uh, verse number 4, Paul writing to the church at Ephesus says, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Peter and John, in the book of Acts chapter number 4, found themselves in the heat of this very battle against the Sadducees, the high priest and the captain of the temple over the healing of a crippled man. You remember that, don't you? You remember that uh, that crippled man, 40 years old, laying at the gate called Beautiful, and uh, Peter and John going up to the temple to pray at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, and they see that man, and he's holding up his little cup, asking an alms, and Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. Give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk it. And the Lord Jesus healed him, and he went into the temple. I mean, he was 
kicking up his heels and praising God. And boy, it caused a stir. Peter and John got arrested. And they was brought before the council and uh, to give an account of why they had done this. And the Bible said they stood, fir- they stood firm and they stood true. But I want to read to you a couple of verses here that tells what happened when they let them go. They, they, they couldn't let them go. Uh, they couldn't keep them in jail. And so they turned them loose. And in Acts 4.23, the Bible's talking of Peter and John and said, being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. They went to church. And the Bible says in the next verse, verse 24, and when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. And in the 31st verse of chapter 4, the Bible says, and when they had prayed, The place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake the word of God with boldness. Another victory scored for the church that will stand together as one in one accord and in one faith. My friend, we're a family here at Welcome Door Baptist Church. We are a family in the family of God bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now we've got God, he's never left us, he'll never leave us or forsake us. We have the Holy Spirit, yes, but when it comes to standing for one another, we're all we've got. Are you listening? We're all we've got. And boy, what a sin to sow discord amongst that. Consistency, unyielding in battle, cooperation, undividing in battle. And then he gives the third one in the remaining verses 28 to 30. He says, you need to have confidence, consistency, cooperation, confidence, being unafraid in battle. Did you get those things? Consistency, unyielding in battle. Cooperation, undivided in battle. Confidence, unafraid in battle. Paul says, in and in nothing, terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but of you to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Paul closes out this portion of our study with these encouragements that should instill confidence in these Philippian believers as they face their battles in the defense of the faith. Like the old song says, we're on the winning side. Because here is what he gave them. In verse 28, he tells them that We can have confidence because we are facing a defeated foe. Battle's already won, folks. War's already won. It's not over, but it's already won. We're fighting. We're facing in our lives as Christians, battling with a defeated foe. And then he tells us in verse 29 that we can have confidence because of the privilege that has been extended to us to be saved. God didn't have to save us. He offered it. Amen. And I'm glad we took it. And then in verse 30, Paul reminds them that we can have confidence because we're not in this fight alone. We're all in this thing together. He talks about having the same conflict which you saw him have. He said, the same conflict you're in. You're not in this by yourself, church. So tonight we finish the first chapter of the book of Philippians with good advice on preparing for the battles to come. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask your blessing upon this message tonight. And I pray that you would just take it and use it. And perhaps something was said tonight that will be a blessing and a help to somebody. 
as they go out and face the world and face the battles to defend the faith. Please give each one traveling grace and mercy home tonight. And Lord, we look forward to the Lord's day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming. God bless you. We are dismissed.